All right, uh, that is the curriculum in general. I now want to turn to uh, a, a few remarks about students and uh, how students participate in the educational process. The pragmatists, uh, like the realists, uh, uh, put the students uh, front and center and see them as the primary agents in the learning process. And this is uh, in, in contrast for both of them to the idealists. The idealists tend to uh, make the teacher more central. The teacher is the person who has the expertise and the character and he or she uh, delivers or imparts uh, things to, to students who uh, may or may not be interested. What we find as we go from idealism to realism, the student uh, takes a more central role and the teacher takes a, a more de-emphasized role. And certainly by the time we get to the pragmatists, the students are really front and center and the role of the teacher uh, is more relegated to being that of a facilitator. But more on the, on the teacher side of the things in a few, uh, the, of the line in a few minutes, I want to focus now on the, the students. Also in keeping here uh, uh, with the pragmatic philosophy is the fact that the pragmatic philosophy emphasizes groups, emphasizes the social over the individuality, and that then means for educational practice that education should be seen primarily as a social enterprise, not something that is an individual student uh, mastering individualized knowledge using his or her own mind. Uh, to work on problems and, uh, and decide what direction he or she wants to take things. Pragmat pragmatists, rather, are much more social, much more communal, much more democratic uh, in their approach to education, and that then means that much or most of education should be done in a, in a group context and uh, should be done in group work. Now, this is then not to say that they won't ever have uh, students doing individual work, just as with the realists, the realists being much more individualistic, they won't, it's not to say that the realists won't ever have students doing group work, but the emphasis is dramatically different. Whereas for the realists, most of education is uh, a matter of individual minds coming to know what they need to know in order to flourish in, in life. Uh, the pragmatists are more likely to argue that most of what we do in life is social, and so therefore education being an, uh, a, a, an exemplar of, of real life, it should mostly be, be group work. So if we are doing uh, 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 reading projects, uh, then we will do uh, reading circles, right, for example. If we are doing chemistry labs, we will have partners on which we are, we are working on the chemistry labs. If we are doing uh, theater, uh, theater is again something that's going to be emphasized by the pragmatists just because it's more easily uh, lending itself to, uh, to, to group projects. If we're doing physical education, we're less likely to do individualized sports as the realists are. As pragmatists, we're more likely to make sure that all of the physical education involves uh, group sports or, or team sports or, or at least group activities right, and so forth. Putting these uh, group projects into practice then means that when teachers are preparing students for doing their work uh, or strategizing how the students are going to uh, do their work ahead of time, the teacher needs to lay the groundwork and be attentive to all the ways in which uh, group uh, work can be successful but also ways in which it can be dysfunctional. If we take the theme of democracy as a, as a guiding value theme for pragmatism, what the teacher is going to want to, uh, to do is ensure that uh, and help students uh, work on their group projects in a way that uh, trains them and models democratic decision making. So he or she uh, uh, may, may initially divide students into various sorts of groups and then help them work through deciding uh, who's going to do what parts of the division of labor, how it's going to be coordinated, if there are differences of opinion, how those are going to be sorted out, uh, uh, helping them uh, uh, with the discussions, uh, then pointing out at a certain point it'll be time to bring the discussions to a close and put things to a vote right as a group. And then uh, as the students get more comfortable with all of these processes, then the, the students then can uh, automate that process and start to do it increasingly for, for themselves. What this also uh, means is that the teacher is on the dysfunctionality side of the equation going to have to pay attention uh, 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 proactively from his or her own experience to all of the ways in which we know that groups can go wrong or be less functional than, than ordinarily uh, we would want them to be. 
For example, uh, does the teacher always decide? You, you four, say, are forming one group, you four are forming another group, or you six, or you three, or whatever the numbers would be. The teacher doesn't want to do that too much because we want the students to start forming their own groups uh, and being the active participants in this process. But we do know that as students, students start to do that, there are some things that start to happen. Uh, students uh, only want to work in groups with their with their friends, right? Or the boys only want to work with boys, and the girls only want to to work with girls. Or some students are more popular, uh, and other students are less popular. And so everybody wants to have the popular kids in their groups, and nobody wants to have the unpopular kids in those groups. Now the teacher then ahead of time has to be aware that these kinds of things are going to arise and. Uh, be ready to intervene or ready to tweak or massage things in such a way so that those things don't uh, become, uh, become commonplace or at least don't uh, become rigidified uh, within, uh, within the, the school year, say for example. We also know as teachers, uh, probably from our own experience as students, that when we are working in groups, there are intra-group dynamics that, uh, that can occur. There are, in many cases, kids who are grasping the material more quickly than other kids, and that can then lead to say on the kids, part of the kids uh, who are grasping the material more quickly, a certain amount of impatience. That can then lead them to say, for example, well, I'm not going to participate in the group project. I'm just going to do it all myself. And uh, uh, then when we have to hand in our group project, really it just amounts to being the work of one or two students. Uh, and they kind of feel that they've been taken advantage of because they're uh, getting, uh, have done rather all of the work, but other students are getting the credit for it. And that also can encourage on this uh, part of the students who didn't do a whole lot of work a kind of uh, parasitic uh, emphasis or, 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 or encourage them to, since they didn't have to do any work in this particular case, but nonetheless they got the credit for the group work as well. So we do know that as teachers that kind of dynamic is going to happen. Uh, how do we uh, monitor the situation as it's evolving to make sure that it isn't happening. We also know that some students uh, uh, are, are likely to be bullies and other students are likely to be more passive. Uh, we know that some students uh, are going to have uh, social skills that don't lend to their working uh, with other people uh, civilly right, and diplomatically. Some students have a difficult time with compromise and so on. So what we then need to do as teachers is, based on our own past experience in experimenting with sometimes successfully and sometimes not group works, uh, really sit down scientifically and make a list of all of the ways in which group uh, dynamics can go wrong and be ready to, to intervene, uh, hopefully not too authoritarianly when these uh, things arise uh, in the student groups that we uh, are, are, are having the students uh, work in.